your Bibles to Psalm 139. As I've been working through the Psalms this summer, I've read the entire Psalm each time. This time, we're only going to be in four verses, so 13 through 16 um, in, the, in the Psalm 139. Um, I will be honest with you, I didn't want to preach this sermon this morning. Um, a few weeks ago, um, I um, felt the need to just speak about this in my pastoral prayer and pray and, and that be the end of it, but, um, but it was like the Lord took his thumb and started pressing on the back of my neck and, um, and said, you need to preach about this. And I said, no, Lord, I, I don't. I, I just, I'll, I'll speak about it beforehand, but I, I don't know that I need to preach a whole sermon about this. And he pressed a little harder and said, no, you're going to preach a sermon about this. And I said, no, I don't think that's a good idea. And then he pressed it a little more, and I was like, okay, okay, I, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. And he let go. I finally had some peace. Um, I am your shepherd as pastor of this church. I'm the one God has put over this flock to care for you and watch out for your soul from dangers that might seek to lead you astray spiritually. And so I felt impressed to preach about this topic so you know rightly how to think about it biblically. Um, especially uh, many of the justifications and objections that come up about it. You need to know how to answer them. On June 24th, 2022, Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court. Roe was decided on January 22nd, 1973, and its ruling said that the Constitution of the United States gives liberty to a pregnant woman to choose to have an abortion. The ruling on June 24th of this year overturned that, and gave, that, um, gave that, that right back to each individual state. So California can make abortion legal, Kentucky can make it illegal, depending what the people want in each state. It's a very significant event in our, in our nation's history. Um, I don't preach the headlines. Um, as I said at the beginning, I preach through a book of the Bible and talk about topics as they come up. But there are time to time where events happen in the world that, that as a pastor I need to speak to. 9-11, COVID-19, and this would be one of them. Um, since the ruling on June 24th, a firestorm has occurred. Uh, many have been fighting for this for over 49 years to see this overturned, um, believing that we shouldn't have the right or freedom to kill the baby in the womb. Um, but the nation is raging, crying out women, that women's rights are being taken away that women are, and, and women are saying, I should get to do what I want to with my own body, and many are saying women's right to health care is being infringed upon, and voices are crying out that we're going backwards in history by doing this. So how do we bring all that together and answer it from a biblical worldview? How do we do that? How should Christians think about this issue? That's what we're talking about today. We, we sang less music today because this may be a longer sermon. Um, a few ground rules for today before we read the text. First of all, as I said in the opening, I want to be as truthful and as loving as possible today. I want to preach as though God will judge my preaching career based on this sermon. But I also want to say everything I'm going to say as though I were counseling a woman who had been forced to have an abortion by her boyfriend. I want to be gentle but firm. Uh, Mount Zion's not really an amen church where you shout amen as I'm preaching. Um, sometimes it happens, but, but it's very rare. Um, I, I just want to encourage you, don't do that today. Um, the point of the sermon is not to hype you up to win a political argument on Facebook. It's to graciously speak to an issue that many people are very um, conflicted on at the moment. Um, this is not a political sermon. Abortion is not a political issue. It's a moral issue. It's just often fought in the political arena. I have no interest in endorsing any politician or political party. I've got no hope in an elephant or a donkey, only in the lamb who was slain. My goal today is to speak to the issue of abortion from the Bible and from a worldview informed by the Bible. Um, not every point I make today is going to point to a direct Bible verse, but all of it is going to be um, based on a worldview shaped by the whole Bible. I just want to say be prepared, because probably most everyone in here at some point will be uncomfortable as we talk. Um, my sermon is very much a pro-life sermon, but even if you are avidly pro-life, there's going to be parts of this that challenge and discomfort you. I say that because when I was preparing it, I had the worst three or four days of the year. I was just depressed as I was preparing this sermon um, because of how challenging it is. The framework of this 
It's going to be centered around the gospel message. The gospel message is in four parts. Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. God created the world perfect. Um, the fall happened. Sin entered the world and broke everything. Jesus came to redeem it and save it. And now in new creation, he's restoring creation back to what it's supposed to be. He's saving sinners. He's um, reestablishing societies of, of churches on the earth. And sinners are now meant to be saved and, and run to Jesus. That's my four points today as we think about this issue, creation, fall, redemption, new creation. So let's read the passage first, or Psalm 139, 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So as we think about the issue of abortion, um, one of the major points, probably the biggest contender in the discussion, is um, the, the nature of, who's, of, of what is in the womb. Um, is the baby in the womb an, an actual person? When does the baby in the womb become a person? At conception or somewhere else down the line? The overwhelming testimony from God's word is that the baby is a person at the moment of conception. When the sperm meets the egg, when fertilization happens, that's when a person begins. Before we were born, God knew everything about us. He, he says that here. He also says that we know Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Even beyond biblical testimony, science overwhelmingly says this. Um, embryology is clear that from the earliest moments of development, you were a full human being. You weren't part of another human being like the skin cells underneath my toenail. You were another. You were a, an, an actual human being. You were already a full, distinct member of the human family, even though you'd yet to fully grow and develop. When Roe v. Wade was passed in 1973, we did not have so much of the technology that we have now, like the ability to do a sonogram. Um, you can actually pay extra today when you're pregnant and get a 3D ultrasound to see the features of your baby's face. They didn't have that in 1973. As science and technology has developed over the past 50 years, it has only fleshed out Psalm 139 and what it's saying. Let me give you some of the highlights of a development of a baby in the womb. At five to six weeks, you can detect a heartbeat. At six weeks the mouth, ears, and nose start to take shape. Brain, the brain and the intestines begin to develop at six weeks. At seven weeks, hands and feet start to emerge. At eight weeks, it's um, known that babies respond to sound, that evidence suggests they are dreaming at eight weeks already. Um, they recoil from pain at this point. We know this because when doctors go in there to draw blood, um, babies at eight weeks will pull their heel back to get away from the pain of the needle. Um, at eight weeks, major organs are functioning, the nervous system, the brain, heart, kidneys, etc. At 10 weeks, the fingernails begin to form. At 11 weeks, babies, the, the baby is almost fully formed. It starts kicking, stretching, and even hiccuping. The diaphragm develops. At 12 weeks, babies can cry. Babies will suck their thumbs at 12 weeks. At 13 weeks, they have a fingerprint that defines their identity in, in our world. Um, already at 13 weeks, babies, female babies, have over 2 million eggs in their ovary. That means their grand, the, the grandchildren of the mother are already there at that point at 13 weeks. The majority of abortions, though, happen by the 13-week mark. So everything we've just said has already happened. 15 weeks. The eyelids are still shut, but they can sense light. They move away from a light beam. The, the gender is evident from an ultrasound at 15 weeks. Um, 17 weeks, the skeleton starts to harden. Um, 19 weeks, their sense, the, the, their sense are developing, and they may hear the voice of those outside the womb. 20 weeks, they can swallow. 22 weeks, babies can survive outside the womb. 
40 weeks is, you know, when, when a baby normally is born. 22 weeks is when a baby can survive outside the womb with a lot of help. 27 weeks, the baby is sleeping and waking up on a regular schedule. 31 weeks, babies can turn their heads. And usually around 37 to 40 weeks is when the mother gives birth. God sovereignly does this. God knits the baby together in the womb. As verse, um, as verse 13 says, he knits us together in our mother's womb. All of this God is sovereignly doing with his power. A baby is not just growing there by a natural process. God is knitting a baby together like a grandma knits a blanket. String by string, he's doing that. In fact, right now, he's using his glorious sovereign power over every pregnant woman on this planet to form and mold people inside of her womb. If a baby is conceived, it's because the sovereign God said so. He put, him, he put the baby there. He's in charge. It's not just a natural process. Ask any couple who has struggled through infertility. They, they, they've tried to get pregnant for years, and nothing has happened. Because babies are only conceived if the sovereign God says so. We can do everything on earth to make sure that happens, but it's only God who gives life. This is why couples get pregnant after things like vasectomies. If God wants you to have a child, you can't stop it because he's the one who does it unless you are not sexually active. And even then, he's made a virgin pregnant before. The baby in the womb has personhood and glory. Notice how much 13 through 16 says, uh, I, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, so, so many personal pronouns there. It's not, um, you know, you, you knitted it together in my mother's womb. Um, it praises you. It is fearfully and wonderfully made. No, there's a person there. Humans are of the highest of all creatures that God made. Um, Genesis 1, we know that um, we are made in God's image. Every human being from a um, six-week-old um, baby in the womb to a 107-year-old um, person in a cancer ward, that they are made in God's image, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, Psalm 8, we, we looked at it a few weeks ago. God crowns humans with glory and sets them just a little below the angels. Humans aren't animals. They are God's image bearers. That means God's character is within them. Animals don't have that. The animals, you know, murder for animals is not a crime. They just eat each other. Animals don't have moral dilemmas. We do. We have regrets. We have dreams. We have ambitions and shame and sadness and all of those things. Animals don't have that. Animals don't. And maybe you say, well, my, my dog gets pretty ashamed when, when it poops on the floor but that's because in the past, when you have gotten onto your dog for pooping on the floor, it's been trained that you get mad when that happens. That's training. That's not morality. That dog knows what happens when it poops on the floor. Frankly, animals think about four things and four things only, eating, sleeping, defecating, and reproducing. Animals don't have a soul. Humans do. Marvel at this. Marvel at this. God is building us for the days he has for us when we are in our mother's womb. He's knitting us together. He's making us who we will be and preparing us for it. All of our days are written down before we're born. That's what verse 16 says, that he, he wrote down every day of my life before I was born and, and mapped it out, what it's going to be like, what I'm being prepared for, what, what you're being prepared for. He did that. All of our days prepared in the womb. So we value all life, womb to tomb. We value life of the mother of the baby in the womb, of the mother carrying that baby, and, and all the way up to the frailty of a, um, a, of a dementia ward. All of it reflects the glory and majesty of God. So this, remember, four parts, creation, now we move into fall. This brings us to the sinfulness of abortion. Abortion, just, just to define it, is the intentional killing of the baby in the womb for a vast array of reasons. Um, it's important that we say intentional because right now the media is trying to clump things like miscarriages in with abortion. They're not the same thing. They often use the same word medically, but they're not the same thing. Abortion is not a new thing. They didn't, do, they didn't do it in the same way thousands of years ago, but killing of babies has been a common practice in cultures for thousands of years. Oftentimes in the past, it was done once they were actually out of the womb already. 
which wouldn't be, which that would be actually be called infanticide, but um, the, the Romans would throw unwanted children into the street to die. They'd get swept away by trash, like trash. Pagan nations, I'm sure you've heard of worship of Molech, they would heat up the statue of a, of a god holding his hands out like this, and they would place their baby on that statue to burn up as an offering to their false god. This has been going on. So let's talk about the how of abortion, the what of abortion, and the why of abortion, the how. So until Roe versus Wade was overturned, abortion was legal in about half the U.S. states, literally up until birth. They called it viability. It's the ability to live on your own outside of the womb because um, we know that, you know, newborns can live outside of the womb without assistance from anyone. Um, two states had up until six weeks that you could get an abortion up to six weeks. The rest had around 20 to 22 weeks, including the state of Georgia. It's still the case in Georgia, but lawmakers are fighting to enact what's called the heartbeat bill. In other words, when you detect a heartbeat, you can't abort. It has been unsuccessful thus far. Depending on when the gestation, the, depending on when in gestation the baby is, abortion procedures vary in what is done. Up until about 10 weeks of pregnancy, usually abortion involves taking pills which cause the woman to miscarry the baby at home. In the second trimester, it's much more graphic. They use tongs to essentially rip the child piece from piece out of the mother's womb and crush its skull. And in the third trimester, when the baby's in its fullest form, it's rare that abortions happen this time, but they do. It's a lethal injection that kills the baby and then the woman delivers. That's the how of abortion. What about the what? The what? Um, I'm giving you a lot of stats here. I'm, I'm, I had slides made to put these up for you, but our slides don't work very much. 42% um, of abortions in 2019 were for women who had already had at least one before. 60% of abortions in 2019 were for women who had, who had had one or more ch children already. 2019, 93% of abortions occurred in the first trimester, up to 13 weeks. 6% occurred 14 to 20 weeks, and 1% was after 21 weeks gestation. In 2019, approximately 19% of pregnancies in the U.S. ended in abortion. What are reasons that abortion is done? This is based on, these are stats based on a sample of about 1,200 women across various abortion clinics in the United States. Um, less than half percent, less than half of 1% of the people getting an abortion was because they were a victim of rape. 3% were because of fetal health problems. 4% was because of physical health problems to the woman. 4% was because it would interfere with education or career. 7% was that the woman didn't think she was mature enough to raise a child yet, or she was too young. 8% um, was because she didn't want to be a single mother. 19% was because they were done having children. They had already had enough. 23% were because I can't afford a baby. 25% was strictly not ready for a child. And 6% was some other reason. Now, a lot of times women are pushed into abortion. A lot of times they're pushed into it. So don't assume that every woman that gets an abortion is just an evil, maniacal baby killer. Um, I've heard stories of fathers telling their teenage daughters that if, that if they ever turn up pregnant as a teenager, they won't be welcome back in the house, and that's despicable. Men, you can do, we can do better than that. Uh, it, it's, it, it's the, in the, for these women, it's either get an abortion or be homeless. And so they have to choose between, in their mind, the lesser of two bad situations. Um, may God judge fathers like that. We have to hold men accountable in abortion too. How many women would not have gotten abortions had it not been for the abusive and dead meat, deadbeat men in their lives? Now, the why of abortion, because I know that's the question for many. Um, that, that, that you ask. Um, it's unthinkable for many of us to ever kill a baby. Uh, I've heard so many of you pray on this issue and talk about this issue, issue and you use the phrase, I just don't understand why people would do this. Remember, um, a few weeks ago we looked at Psalm 2. Flip back there really quick. Psalm 2. The Bible gives an answer for why our culture as well as other cultures um, would think of taking the life of children. Psalm 2. Verse 
verses 1 through 3, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Uh, remember, that just is saying like the, the, the nature of the human heart is that we find every way possible to break free from God and what he has and what he gives to our life, good or bad. We do everything we can to become the sovereign of our life. We don't want God telling us what to do and directing our steps. We want to plan it ourselves. That's the nature of what sin is. We want to free ourselves from the bondage to a sovereign God. That's what sin is. It's not just doing bad things. It's not just saying cuss words and smoking drugs. No, every time we sin in thought, word, or deed, we are trying to escape the rule and reign of the sovereignty of God and seek our own ways. I know what's best for me better than God does. He's not going to tell me what to do. Sin is not just bad things. It's hatred of God himself. It's Proverbs 8, 36. It says, all who hate God love death. And so you would expect when the world hates God, they're going to be a culture of death, wouldn't you? Vladimir Putin has ordered the death and destruction on Ukraine because he hates God. And abortion is so prevalent in the U.S. because a lot of the U.S. hates God. Or at least they hate the God of the Bible. They maybe don't hate the God that's made in their own image. Um, abortion is prevalent because people want sovereignty over their own lives. You hear it in so many of the justifications for abortion that we're going to hit in just a minute. This is my life, and I should get to do with it what I want, and I don't want to have a child that holds me up. Abortion is prevalent because Satan hates children. He wants to destroy them and prevent God's image from continuing to spread throughout the world because we're image bearers of God. That's why psychos target elementary schools for shootings, and that's why sex predators target church preschool programs. Just hear this. Six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. Sixty-three million abortions have occurred since Roe versus Wade. That's ten and a half Holocaust. So let's jump to those justifications and then apply the gospel to the issue um, because I don't want all this to be down in the dumps all day. Um, so um, the, the reason I felt so prompted to, to talk about this sermon, to preach this sermon, is the fact that um, since Roe versus Wade happened, um, a, a lot of justifications have been given of why, um, you know, most of the time abortion's okay, but what about this circumstance, and what about this circumstance, and what about this one, and this one? And as your shepherd, I see it as my responsibility to guide you spiritually in those places so you don't get led astray, because being deceived on an issue like abortion is the beginning for a lot of the deconstruction of the more core doctrines of the Christian faith. If the devil can lead you astray on something like abortion, he can lead you astray on um, Jesus being where your salvation comes from. So let's walk through those justifications, and I'm going to hit them as fast as I can because there's a lot of them. Um, we'll hit the big three first. What about when the mother's health is in danger? This is the one big one being used at the moment to say that Roe was that, that the Roe ruling was wrong. Um, and of course, if uninformed lawmakers make laws that prohibit women from getting treatments for things like miscarriages or what we'll talk about in a minute, ectopic pregnancies, we call that out and fight against it because that's not abortion. It may use the medical term abortion, but it's not the same thing. It's not illegal in any state right now to treat any one of those things. It's, it's not. But just about the woman's health, according to multiple OBGYNs, nearly every time the mother's health may be the risk, may be at risk by the pregnancy, abortion is not the answer. Delivering the baby is. It's called a preterm delivery. Babies can live outside the womb, remember, 22 to 24 weeks. If they're born during that time, it will take some time in the NICU, but they can survive and thrive. Yet there are abortions that happen at 23 weeks when with a little help the baby could survive. Ectopic pregnancies, what about those? An ectopic pregnancy is when fertilization happens, and so when fertilization happens, um, the um, fertilized egg has to travel down to a certain point in the woman's body, and it doesn't make it. It gets caught, and um, essentially that can end up making the woman in major trouble health-wise. But if that happens, like, it's not a viable child anymore. It's got to get to that certain point in the woman to be able to grow and thrive. It's not a viable child at that point. It's, it's, it's going to get stuck there and grow, and the child will not live. 
The fertilized egg takes three or four days to get there. Um, that egg is not viable. There's no possible way for the baby to survive, and it's, if it's not treated, it will kill the mother. But removing an ectopic pregnancy is not an abortion. It's completely different, and it's completely legal. They were removing ectopic pregnancies in the 50s and 60s, long before Roe versus Wade was a thing. What about miscarriages? You know, I wouldn't doubt that in this very room there are women who have had miscarriages. And I just want to say it's a major insult to you to, for, for them to be called abortions. You wanted those babies. What about possible death of the mother? Former Surgeon General Everett Koop said, Partial birth abortions are not needed to save the life of the mother. In my 36 years in pediatric surgery, I have never known of one instance where the child had to be aborted to save the mother's life. Even Planned Parenthood's Dr. Alan Guttmacher said, Today it is possible for almost any patient to be brought through pregnancy alive unless she suffers from a fatal illness such as cancer or leukemia. And if so, abortion would be unlikely to prolong much less safe lives. Second, what about the case of rape or incest? I cannot presume to know the pain of that on a woman, on a family, or on any other. The thought of that happening to my wife or to any other woman in my life infuriates me and is heartbreaking. Those are horrible, horrible, horrible situations. But come back to the fundamental question. Is the child in the womb a person? Would you kill a child conceived of rape who was outside the womb already? Two legal truths to know. We shouldn't give capital punishment to the children of criminals, and we should severely punish rapists. They shouldn't get off a little scotch-free like they do currently. We need reform in the laws there. But even in those situations, sometimes God takes horrible circumstances in our life, and he makes good come out of them. Scripture's full of stories of that happening where unimaginable evil, and, and it's turned to, to glorious good. Next one, the government can't tell me what to do with my body. This is the my body, my choice argument. Um, several answers to this. Um, remember, I'm giving you these answers not to, not to you know, bolster on other people, but so that you know how to answer these things according to your uh, understanding of the world through the Bible. Um, the government can't tell me what to do with my body. Well, first of all, the baby is not part of the woman's body. It has its own blood type, its own organs, its own dreams. But the government makes laws all the time that tell us what we can and can't do with our body. Um, I can't come up to you and punch you in the face. Like, that's illegal. It's illegal for me to do that. That's a restriction on my body. I can't take all my clothes off and walk stark naked down Tift Avenue. That's illegal. That's a restriction on my body. And then I would ask you just, what about all the little women torn apart in their mother's womb every year? Have we asked them what they want to do with their body? This is the same argument that plantation owners used in the days of slavery. Those slaves are my property, and I can do with them what I want. No, they're, they're people. They're people. We don't own our bodies. God does. If a baby's conceived in the womb, God put it there. We try to break away from that, Psalm 2, but God put it there. If we owned our bodies, we could prevent ourselves from getting pregnant, and only God can do that. Connected to that one a little bit, men shouldn't make laws about women's bodies. Well, um, the Supreme Court in 1973 that passed Roe versus Wade was nine men. And so we can't have it both ways. Either they, men can make laws about women's bodies or they can't. If they can, then Roe versus Wade was valid and the overturning of Roe versus Wade was valid. If they can't, Roe versus Wade was never valid in the first place because it was made by men. You can't speak to this. You're a man and you can't get pregnant. And I would say evil is still evil whether I'm a man, woman, or child. The fetus is not a baby. You notice I'm not using the word fetus today. Let's call it what it is. It's a baby. Fetus is a Latin word that means baby. We can speak English. Despite that science has proved this one so wrong, the argument goes that a baby isn't fully human until it can breathe on its own outside of the womb. If that's what defines right to life, we've got a lot of people in the hospital on vents that need to have the plug pulled on them. In fact, during COVID, when someone went on a vent, we should have just terminated them right there. By that logic, that's what that's saying. The unborn doesn't have the same values or the, the same value or the same rights as the mother. The mother's rights are more important than the baby's rights. And, and I just want to ask, do you think there's danger in creating two classes of human beings? Um, you know, that sounds like in the 
American history three-fifths compromise where African-American people were only counted as three-fifths of a human, or it sounds kind of like Nazi Germany. If it is outlawed, women will still get abortions in unsafe ways. This is the back alley argument. Um, we'll, we'll logically address it in just a second, but you know that's the same thing as saying if murder is outlawed, people will kill people in an unsafe way, so we should make it legal and safe so it can be done in a proper way. No, the argument says that if abortion is illegal, women will get unsafe abortion in back alleys with coat hangers from creepy men in trench coats, and they might die from it. But abortion has been almost completely illegal in Texas for eight months, and women are not dying by the masses from getting illegal abortions. They're, they're just not getting abortions. You know, people say laws have no impact on behavior. Yes, they do. Most people are going to follow the law. Um, Forty years ago, it was legal to smoke cigarettes in restaurants and airplanes, and they made anti-smoking laws, and nobody smokes in those places today. The death, um, Mary Calderon, the Planned Parenthood medical director in the 60s, said this, before Roe versus Wade was a thing, the death rate from illegal abortions is so low that it wasn't even worth commenting on. She said that. She said 90% of abortions prior to 1973 were not performed by creepy dudes in dark alleys with coat hangers. They were performed by doctors who skirted the law because penicillin has made surgical procedures safe for a long time but laws don't change hearts. That's being used by a lot of Christians right now to say that we just shouldn't talk about this issue. Laws don't change hearts. We've got to preach the gospel to them. And I agree. It's true. Laws do not change the hearts of sinners. But I'm thankful that laws are in place against crime. I'm thankful that it's legal to kill me or break into my home because it, it deters people from doing it. Romans 13, 3 and 4, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to the bad. Would you have no fear of the one who has authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. We don't wait for, uh, we don't, we don't wait for hearts to be changed to pass laws, because nothing would ever change then. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the law cannot make the white man love me, but it can make him, it can't keep him from lynching me. I, I want to change hearts through preaching of the gospel. That's what I do every, that's what I aim to do every Sunday. But until those hearts are changed, laws protect the, un, the, the, the innocent from being unjustly treated. Um, what if the baby is going to be born with Down syndrome or some um, other disability. Um, some reports have said that up to 92% of women who are told they're going to have a Down syndrome child choose to abort. Um, I find the idea that um, killing babies with Down syndrome, I find that more abhorrent than, than that a baby would have Down syndrome. It sounds like Nazi Germany to me. we got to pick and choose the, the best people for society and throw the others aside. All of us, I think, know people with disabilities, and they bring such joy to the world around them, don't we? Now, the argument would be that it's too difficult for the parents to care for that child, and that's just where we have to sound harsh in our response and say, look, if life gives you a Down syndrome child, that's your lot. God creates a baby within a mother that, that has Down syndrome. He put it there, and he has incredible purposes for that baby. It's American arrogance that would think, oh, that's going to be too difficult for me. I'm going to get out of this. John 9, Jesus comes to the pool, um, comes and sees a, a man born blind, and his disciples ask him, Rabbi, who sinned, this, this, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And what did Jesus say? He said it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We lay down our lives in those circumstances and love those children no matter who they are. If Down syndrome people don't deserve to be born, then the question you have to ask yourself is, do they deserve to live if they're already born? Um, when my mother-in-law was pregnant with Adrian, um, her and my, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, who's now passed away, they, they went to the doctor one day, and the doctor sent them to a specialist and told them, hey, your um, child is, prob is, is gonna be born a waterhead. Um, I, I recommend you, you should abort. And I got the coolest mother-in-law in the world because she said no. She said no. And, of course, Adrian was not born a waterhead. But um, what if the child's going to be born into poverty or foster care? Well, 
are you telling me you think it's a better solution to just end their life? A um, couple more, and then we'll get to the, the gospel and end on that note. Christians are only pro-birth. They're not pro-life. That's just not true historically. Um, the, some of the earliest writings of the church, Christians were known um, to, to literally be people who would pick up those Roman babies out of the streets that had been cast away and raise them in their home. It's statistically proven that, that um, double the amount of Christians adopt than those who aren't Christians. Um, a lot of times this is leveled at pro-life people to try to diminish their argument, but it doesn't work because, of course, we value all life. It just so happens that one of those areas is the unborn, I'm not ready for a child. Childbearing is seen in our country as inconvenient because women have ambitions and children make those ambitions have to take a back seat. Um, there's this great quote by a woman named Rebecca Merkel. Um, but a woman raising her children is not only shaping the next generation, she's also shaping little humans who are going to live forever. The souls she gives birth to are immortal. And somehow our culture looks at a woman who treats that as, it, if, it might, as if it might be an, an important task and says, it's a shame she's wasting herself. She could be doing things important like filing paperwork for insurance claims. But okay, maybe, maybe you aren't ready for a child. Don't you know there's countless couples who are dying to adopt a child? And, and that could um, be the answer to a lot of these objections. Having the baby doesn't mean raising the baby. You may give the baby up for adoption, and wonderful parents will take that child and raise he or she. This is especially important to remember in all of these. I'm sure there's other justifications that I didn't cover. I noticed the time, so um, I want to jump on to the, to the end here. Um, this has been the bulk of my sermon today. I want you to have an understanding of how to answer those justifications biblically and from a biblical worldview. Um, it, listen, it's important to remember that abortion is not the unforgivable sin. I want you to hear this more than anything today. We must speak truth in love, not truth without love and not love without truth, for that is not love. The most heartbreaking thing you could do that could happen to today is that you take everything that I've just told you and use it to rant and rave like a madman on social media with a butcher's knife. Um, you know where you run around just calling people baby mur murderers. Don't do that. Don't do that. In the past 10 years, it's been seen as the patriotic American thing to just have a loud, arrogant, rude demeanor toward anyone who disagrees with you, and that helps no one. It, just telling it like it is without any thought of compassion and gentleness, that's not the heart of Christ. Abortion is not the unforgivable sin, but it is like all other sins. It will be judged. Abortion, like all sins, places the sinner under the wrath of God. So women who have gotten an abortion are under that judgment. Doctors who have performed abortions are under that judgment. Men who have pushed and encouraged an abortion are under that judgment. Parents and grandparents who have pushed for abortion are under that judgment. Leaders who have permitted that uh, an abortion are under that judgment. Pastors and counselors who have counseled people to have an abortion are under that judgment. And Christians who have done nothing about abortion are under that judgment. All of these people are under the judgment of God, and if nothing changes, they will reap that judgment for all eternity under the wrath of God, but that's not God's will for any of them. What good news we have for women who have had abortions. The Son of God became a man and gestated in the womb of Mary for nine months. He went through every form of growth that we do, and he was born, and he lived his life completely free of sin so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for sinners. And they nailed Jesus to the cross, and he hung there for six hours as a sacrifice for sin. He bore the wrath of God for all sinners there. Jesus died for abortion. He died that abortion doctors could be saved, and he died so that women who have had an abortion can be saved, and all the others. Salvation is now available to anyone who has had an abortion, who has supported abortion, who has encouraged abortion, who has performed abortion or permitted it or done nothing about it. The cross of Christ can wipe away all sin, guilt, and shame forever. Don't you understand? An unborn baby doesn't have to die so a woman can have life. Jesus already did that for her. And there is great, there's greater life to be found in Christ than in any opportunity the woman might lose for an unwanted pregnancy. Salvation is available and free to all who will confess their sins and believe the gospel and surrender their life 
to him. And God takes some of the greatest sinners and uses them as his greatest servants. Think of Paul, the Christian murderer. Think of Moses, the guy who killed people. Think of David, the adulterer. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be conceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the spirit of our God, newness of life is available to all who come to Jesus. God can save women who have aborted and transform them and use them to serve women in that brokenness. And God can help you find healing from abortion. Even though I know where the majority of you stand on this issue, I'm not ignorant of the fact that it's very possible Either a woman in this room has had an abortion or a man in this room has encouraged a woman he got pregnant to have an abortion, and you have such shame in your life for that. Stats say 95% of people in the church who have had an abortion have never dealt with it. You need to deal with it. You need to confess it and find forgiveness and find healing. Jesus is standing ready not to scorn you, but to forgive you. He's not shocked by you. He's not offended by you. He's gentle and lowly, and you will find rest for your soul. So confess your past sins and turn from them. Talk to me. I can promise you I will not gasp that you've had an abortion because I'm a worse sinner than you are. Talk to a Christian counselor. Talk to a friend. Jesus stands ready to restore and forgive. There's healing available for you. You just have to come to him. So as we conclude, what do we do now that we have made this case? Well, a few things. Um, as we think about it, ask yourself the question, what will my grandkids think of me? especially for, for people my age. What, what will my grandkids one day think of me? I love history. Do you know what I find myself doing a lot when I read history? I read history thinking, why didn't they do something? Why didn't people rise up and kill Hitler when he was killing Jews? Why didn't people rise up and stop the lynching of African-American people? Why? Are my grandkids going to look at our generation and think, why didn't they do something about the unborn? So what can we do? Ephesians 5:11 take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness but instead expose them so three action steps as you go I've adapted these straight from a sermon Matt Chandler a pastor in Texas gave a few years ago first of all repent of our indifference repent of our indifference our attitude on abortion might be my hands are clean because I've never had an abortion or supported abortion but just understand no baby is saved by you just being pro life in your heart you got to do something more than that Secondly, pray. Some like to say, don't pray, just take action. But prayer is part of taking action. You must pray that abortion would become unthinkable in our nation. But also you must confess the sins of our nation. Daniel and Daniel 9 confessed the sins of the nation of Israel in repentance. And many were sins he, had ne he hadn't actually committed, but he confessed them. And thirdly, we get off the sidelines and we get involved. This is more than just voting. Um, absolutely use your vote, but, but do something more locally and practically. Let's, um, it's more than just calling abortion murder. Don't just shake your fist at darkness. That does nothing. No, you need to think in terms of proactive responses and reactive responses. Proactive is um, advocacy, pregnancy centers. Um, I have a friend who up until Roe was passed would go to Planned Parenthood and beg women to not get abortions, try to help them. Um, that's scary, and that's a sacrifice. People mock you for that. We don't have a Planned Parenthood in Tipton, so we can't do that specifically. But we should be known as a community that loves women and cares for women, opens up our homes to them, open up our wallet to them, and we should be willing and ready to adopt and or foster. And then reactive. So when situations land in your lap, what do you do? You need to develop a plan with your family that if a situation ever comes before you, how are you going to respond? You know, if, if your daughter or granddaughter ends up pregnant, um, you need to have a plan beforehand of how you're going to help her with that. If it ever falls in your lap of, if you don't adopt my baby, I'm going to abort it, you need to have a plan for that. Don't just do a bunch of crazy amounts of work in the next two weeks and then check it off. This has to become a lifestyle. It becomes radical. We have to be willing to do some crazy things here that disrupt our comfortable American lives. Let abortion be seen as so inconceivable because we support women so much. I want to invite you back tonight. We're going to have a panel up here. 
um, four people, a, a pastor, a worker at the Tifton Pregnancy Care Center, a worker at Called to Care, and a worker at CASA. I'm going to ask them a lot of practical questions about some of these ways to get involved and ways to serve women and ways to help the unborn. I'm, I'm just going to let them talk and let you hear it. And then I hope that will move us um, to, to, to get involved. Um, I'm prayerfully working through how to involve our church in this issue. We, we must be a voice for the voiceless. We must fight for those who cannot defend themselves. We must do this so equipped with the gospel to see hearts changed. This is the heart of Jesus, who was the one who said, let the children come to me, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, this is a hard issue um, because, Lord, the answer seems so logical until you think about all the various circumstances. Um, when, when you think about um, destitute women who don't know how they're going to pay for a baby that they, that they have, when you think about women who have been forced into this by a deadbeat man, when you think about women who are um, ashamed of the fact that they got an abortion 15 years ago. Lord, we, we, we've got to meet these circumstances with compassion, but do so truthfully. And Lord, that's so difficult. To, Lord, Lord, you know in my heart today's been one of the hardest sermons I've ever had to preach because of all those different circumstances to consider. Lord, I pray that you would take what is said today and work in our hearts and move in us to get involved. Lord, we repent of our nation um, being so apt to, to um, taking the lives of others. Lord, would you cause our nation to turn back to you? Lord, would you change our apathetic hearts that, that, that think being pro-life in our heart is enough? It's not. And would you help us to get involved, to serve women and to help the unborn and to change our hearts about this issue and be willing to sacrifice of ourselves for the sake of others because that's what Jesus did for us. And we can never do it how he did it, but Lord, we can um, live out as little Christ here on this earth. Change our hearts, Lord. May hearts be changed and saved by the gospel. And may abortion become unthinkable in our nation because of how supportive and cared for they are by the church. Women are by the church. Move in us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.